Thank you for joining us again on the Real Biblical Application Podcast. Today, I have special guest with me, Austin Maddox, and I've assigned him 1 Corinthians 15, 29, which is where the Mormons and, and others at times in history have taken the doctrine of baptism for the dead. There it says, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not raise at all, or rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Before we dive into this verse, Austin, how about you take some time to kind of introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks for uh, for having me on and assigning uh, this particular verse. I'm really excited about that. Um, I am living in Columbia, Missouri right now, have been for almost three years. It's hard to believe, but uh, yeah, since 2019, I've been here in Columbia, Missouri, working with the congregation um, here, the Rice Road Church of Christ, um, loving every minute of it, and things have been going going really well here uh, lately. Uh, originally lived in Indiana, and that's where I was born and raised, and so it's, um, Missouri's not all that different from Indiana, so it's a pretty seamless transition, so that's uh, that's what I'm all about. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on, and you, you live in in my hometown where I was born, uh, so, so we have that That's friendship right. with one another. And uh, That's right. I, I didn't realize you had been in Columbia for three years already. It'll it'll be three years at the well at the end of August. So I guess it's more like two and a half. But uh, yeah, I don't know uh, the way time moves. I'm just I'm just rounding up at this point. Everything's just uh, <laughs> just flying now. But yeah, every uh, uh, once a month we've uh, we've got a you know a church dinner right there in your old living room. So yeah, it's super cool. <laughs> for, for those who don't know that the church that Austin preaches at, I lived in uh, whenever I was born. I think for probably a year or two um, after I was born, I, there was a basement at the church, and there was an apartment down there, and that's where I lived because my dad was preaching there. And uh, now that's the church that Austin works at. So anyway, it's just a little fun fact. And I was there, uh, I guess it was a few weeks ago now, and we'd eat mm -hmm. uh, down in the basement, my old home. And it's always a little bit nostalgic and brings back memories somewhat. Even though I was only two years old, I do have memories uh, living there. So anyway, so to bring us back on topic and uh, back to the Bible instead of my history, uh, so this doctrine of baptism for the dead, for those who are not aware, um, maybe many people have never heard of this is essentially the, the Mormons will practice a proxy baptism. So if, if someone dies, um, someone in the LDS church, the Latter-day Saints church will be baptized, preferably a family member, I believe on behalf of that person who died. And so, you know, th this brings up a lot of questions, a lot of issues, I think. And um, I think it's important that we are at least familiar with this doctrine as we may encounter it at different times in our life. So before we dive into this, what is kind of the context of 1 Corinthians 15, 29? What's going on here? that this verse would be quoted. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important. Um, well, as with any Bible study, obviously you want to get the full context of what's going on, but particularly when you're talking about this verse, it, it seems to me that a lot of what happens in this verse or a lot of the, the false concepts that come from this verse come from, just plucking it out and not really taking in the full context of what's being discussed here. So the discussion from what I can see here in first Corinthians chapter 15, uh, I think the, the real context begins there uh, in about verse 12. Um, you mind if I go ahead and read like verse 12 through verse 20? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. So, 
So there it reads, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. It says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, and the pre- previous verses are um, alluding to that, that is part of the gospel message that Christ rose from the dead on the third day. How do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Uh, pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So to me, that's where that is, although these aren't the verses directly um, before verse 29, this is where, this is the main uh, context I think is is coming from um, verses twenty one through twenty eight there um, are still they're still um, amazing verses and I'm not trying to discredit them or take them uh, out of this conversation but they're they're more talking about um, like verse twenty two for as in Adam all die even so Christ in Christ shall all be made alive uh, it talks about there in uh, verse twenty four about uh, the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. Um, Verse 27, um, he's put all things under his feet. When he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. And now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So while those verses are really good, I think, when we get to verse 29, it, it feels like verses 21 through 28 are kind of uh, parenthetical. They're, they're talking about, um, they're taking this topic of resurrection in just a, a little bit different direction. Um, and then it seems like Paul comes back in verse, verses 29 through 32, then talking about Again, the uh, the consequences of not believing in the resurrection of any resurrection, um, because if you don't believe Christ is risen from the dead, then I, he makes the point here. Then you must not believe in any resurrection. Period. So, verse verses twelve through twenty are are the context. I think that these are coming in at where you view verses twenty one through twenty eight in kind of a parenthetical. Uh, separate, uh, separate uh, topic almost, not entirely, but a little bit, a little bit different um, point of view there. And then verse 29 picks up that, um, that concept of the consequences of not believing in a resurrection. Several times uh, in, in what you just read, and if Christ is not risen, this is a uh, verse of uh, 14, sorry. Mm-hmm. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false uh, we are found false witnesses to God because we have testified of God that he has raised up Christ whom he did not raise up. If in fact the dead did not rise. So the point I'm trying to make, and, and I could continue reading and keep on plucking out the we's and the uh, ours and, you know, things like that. Whenever we get down to verse 29, it says, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? And maybe I'm putting the cart before the horse at this point. Um, but are we talking about Christians here in verse 29? that are baptizing people for the dead Uh, because we have a lot of we's which seems to be talking about christians uh, and the message that they're presenting and then all of a sudden you have a they uh, and then Mm -hmm. it it continues and saying why then are they baptized for the dead so just as part of the context and, and you can be as brief with with this as you want 
um, if I'm putting the cart before the horse. Are we talking about Christians who are baptizing people for the dead in this uh, context, do you think? To me, that that is a really good question. And there there are a couple of viewpoints that they focus on that particular um, that particular word, the fact that it's talking about a they, and they, um, I think Kaufman takes this view. Uh, there, there's a few others that take this view that um, that actually Paul is talking about some uh, proxy vicarious baptism um, that other people are doing. Uh, at that moment in time and making that argument, um, uh, I believe he calls it an argumentum ad hom, uh, hom, hominem, argumentum ad, hom, <laughs> ad hominem. Um, That's a mouthful. <laughs> basic. Uh, well, it is uh, for, for me, the non-Latin speaking individual. So uh, basically what that boils down to is he's making an argument off of something already that's false. Um, that of proxy baptism or baptism for the dead. That's what Kaufman would say and saying that that's what they are doing. That's not what Christians do. That's not what we do, but they do that. And if they are doing that because they believe in a resurrection, how much more should, should we believe in a resurrection? That's, that's the basic tenet of that. We'll talk you know more about that later. Um, I believe that, well, I don't believe that the they is talking about people who um, are already Christians. I think it's talking about people, um, but that's an interesting point uh, because I, I'm torn between two points and both of them um, have a little bit different, uh, different take on the word they. So, um, so that may be a point that we're going to have to answer towards, towards the end of it here. So there's, there's a little tidbit. Okay. So people, the people will stick to the end, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'll just let you continue with the context. I probably put the cart before the horse there a little bit. <laughs> it's a great question. And in fact, it's, it's one of the hinging questions on this particular verse. So um, continuing that context. So verse 29, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? So there's, there's that key word there, the they. Uh, and why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? Verse 30, I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So um, verses 12 through 20, and then the following um, verses 30 through 32, Make up that context, and I think it's really, really important that we establish that first because the context should always influence how we look at the Bible anyway, right? Um, and, and I think some of the, the viewpoints that we're going to look at don't, don't really acknowledge these, um, these contextual verses. So, um, so if I may, I'm going to go through some of the other viewpoints that are that are levied. A lot of them are just, if I'm being honest, they're just garbage. They really are. <laughs> some people try really, really hard um, to make something happen with this verse, and it, it's just it's just not there. So a lot of people, you'll have almost as many viewpoints as you will people talking about this particular verse. Um, in the Tyndale Bible Dictionary, that's what I'm quoting here, um, it lists here that most interpretations of the phrase baptized for the dead fall into one of three categories. Either it's metaphoric baptism, it's normal baptism, or I would, in my words, I would say that would be Christian baptism or salvific baptism, or baptism by proxy. Um, so that's, that's the three main views that they give. I think that's probably better. It's better than... Um, uh, this uh, this list here that I'm going to read from uh, from the Zondervan uh, Illustrated Bible Dictionary. So it has 
that it's either vicarious baptism to benefit those who died unbaptized. That's the that's the LDS position, the Mormon position. Um, baptize, baptism for the sake of the dead, that is, in order to secure reunion with Christian relatives after death, a little bit the same. Baptism on account of the dead, that is, because of the witness and life of Christians martyred for the faith, such faith leading to the con uh, conversion and subsequent baptism of others. Baptism to take the place of the dead, that is, to make up their number, and so perhaps to hasten the second coming by assisting the completion of one of its preconditions. No. Baptism over the dead, that is, over their graves, to express, uh, to express solidarity with them if they are Christian believers, if they are not to involve them in salvation by this ritual. No, it's not. I'm sorry. Uh, sir. Yeah, 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 sorry. I'm just, uh, I'm just motoring quick on question. here. Quick question. I'm intrigued by this baptism over the grave. Uh, right. I, I assume we're talking about a physical grave here. And but do they set up a kiddie pool? Is it immersion? Is it sprinkling? Is it pouring? W w what kind of baptism are we talking about when we're talking about a baptism over someone's grave? Do we wait till it rains? Maybe. <laughs> uh, that would be the easiest, I would think. Um, or maybe when the sprinklers kick on, I, you know. And when you get to that point, I feel like. Oh, you're in dangerous ground when you start saying that, okay, what this verse means is that obviously we have to go to a graveyard over a physical grave and perform this baptism. Uh, so it's dangerous. I, I didn't really see anybody that held that position like super seriously. Um, Cause I, I would kind of like to know, you know, how that's done. Um, uh, you know, maybe that's the reason for the catacombs, you know, you have the catacombs in caves and then right over the top of that, you'd have, have a baptistry. Um, but that seems, there are so many lo physical logistical problems with that, like to begin with, like you say, do we get a kiddie pool? You know, do we, um, do we have some movable baptistry over all these graves, uh, let alone the spiritual implications. So I don't really know, to be honest with you. Okay, it's just an interesting question. It intrigued me. Yeah, uh, yeah, me too. That was that was one of the first, um, really weird ones that I ran across. That I was like, okay, uh, now now somebody's just they're just off on a on a tangent here, having fun. Anyways, go, um, go, go ahead. Okay, okay. So let's see. That was number five. Number six, and there's 12 of these, by the way, so I'll, I'll breeze through these. Oh, wow. Ceremonial uh, ablution because of defilement through contact with the dead body. Prayer for the dead, number seven, described figuratively as baptism for them, comparable to the way sacrifice is sometimes spiritualized as prayer in the, in the New Testament. Uh, number eight, death for the dead. Um in which the death of Christians regarded as redemptive and as securing salvation for the dead um, and described as baptism because this symbolizes death. Number nine, baptism to wash away mortal sins. Number 10, baptism to confess the resurrection of the dead because it symbolizes death and resurrection. 11, baptism to secure benefit after death because the thought of death has hastened the act of baptism. And number 12, baptism on account of the apostles whose suffering makes them truly dead. Um, so a lot of these, uh, again, you you may run across some individual out there that might believe seriously in this, but the, the majority of these are really confined to the three main views, that it's either metaphoric, pardon me, that it's um, normal or... Christian baptism, or that it's baptism by proxy. And those those are really the only three, historically speaking, that have had any credence given to them. Um, yeah. So, so how has this verse been used historically? Um, what are some of the uh, historical ways in early history that um, ba baptism for the dead was used? Yeah. Um, so historically speaking, um, 
some of the first individuals that talked about this uh, would be uh, Tertullian. Um, and he lived between 155 and 220 AD. Um, and his mm. take, um, it's, it's interesting. And again, this gets into a historical um, fact. Prior, towards the end of his life, he drifted towards uh, uh, Montanism. So prior to his drift towards uh, following after Montanus, he believed that it was baptism by proxy. Uh, once he started drifting uh, a little bit away, he, I don't know that he ever came out and said exactly what it was, but he started writing books. Um, one was um, the book uh, against uh, uh, Marcion. So you had the Marcionites, you had the um, uh, Cerinthians, and these were two Gnostic groups. Sometimes we talk about Gnostics, you know, if we're mm -hmm. uh, talking about the epistles of John, right? And the Gnostics had different factions within them. So uh, Marcion and Cerinthius, from what I understand, were, were a couple of these. And these individuals uh, had, had some influence on what people believed on this particular uh, particular thing here. So, um, in fact, uh, Chrysostom, uh, which he would live in the, was it the third, that would be the fourth and fifth century, I think. Uh, he attributed actually the practice of baptism by proxy to the Sir, uh, Cerinthians and to the, uh, Marcionites, um, and identified them as Gnostic groups. Um, Ambrosister and Tertullian, they affirmed that the practice was legitimate and found among the New Testament Christians, although Tertullian later recanted that belief uh, of baptism by proxy. Um, the practice of baptism by proxy was carried out there in, um, in the second and the third century, and and even into the fourth and at the very end of the fourth century, the practice was forbidden by uh, the councils of Carthage in 397 AD. So um, it, it got some, some traction there for those few hundred years of this whole idea of baptism by proxy. So historically speaking, that, that was kind of what was going on. Um, I was trying to think if there was any other, ah, yeah, here we go. Uh, there's a Mormon, um, a poly, I don't know if apologist, uh, a scholar at least, a Mormon scholar, uh, John uh, Vetness. And he has this. He said that baptism for the dead was indeed practiced in some Orthodox Christian circles. It's indicated by the decisions of two late 4th century councils. The fourth canon of the Synod of Hippo, held in 393, declares the Eucharist shall not be given to dead bodies nor baptism conferred upon them. Uh, that ruling was confirmed four years later in 397 in the sixth canon of the Third Council of Carthage. So, um, historically speaking, that was what was going on uh, with this verse and how it was used. Uh, later, when you get into the Reformation, uh, Martin Luther, he regarded this particular passage as uh, being baptized um, it's just a simple baptism. Uh, John Calvin saw it as uh, a reference to being baptized close to death. Uh, again, that's one of the more out there positions and not held um, seriously in many camps. But historically speaking, that's kind of what was how this verse has been viewed. That, that one about the the Mormons and the, the Eucharist, <laughs> we don't offer the Eucharist to those who are dead, uh, is pretty interesting. <laughs> it's, it's funny that that had to be written down, <laughs> you know, in order for people, people to take that seriously or that that was talked about in, in seriousness. But yeah, um, apparently that was the turning point for some folks that, well, I, you know, we don't give the Eucharist to dead people, so maybe we shouldn't be baptizing for them either. And 
I, <laughs> and with that sentiment, I agree. That's kind of like the, the baptizing over the grave to me. Uh, yeah. You know, if, if someone were to offer communion to someone who is dead, what would that look like? Do they, do they <laughs> dig a hole and, and put a straw down to their grave and <laughs> fill it with juice or, <laughs> you know, th that would be an interesting uh, proposition and, and more, yes. more of a, oh, duh, of course not type of, <laughs> type of situation. Right. You know, it, it's funny when, when you have people that truly genuinely believe something with all of their might, they're going to come to all kinds of conclusions and go to extreme lengths that you would never have thought possible. Right. So who knows? Maybe they had some kind of system um, or maybe they had started developing a system and somebody's like, no, no, uh, th this has got to stop. <laughs> this is too much. Uh, let's get into this proxy baptism. Yeah. Um, th th this is the more modern position, I would say, um, of the ones you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. the most prevalent among, among Mormons, um, is, is this vicarious or proxy baptism. Can you tell us a little bit about their position on that? Yeah. And the more I dug into it, you know, we, we hear that said, and, and I fear sometimes we're too quick to, to just immediately, you know, slam the door on something without fully understanding what they're trying to say. Because what, they, what they're trying to say, um, I think it's, it's falsely based, but it's not, you know, with, with every lie, there's a, there's a kernel of truth, right? And I think, I think uh, that's a lot the case with, with this uh, particular position of baptism by proxy that the Mormon, the LDS church currently holds today. So they believe, for example, um, that baptism is a prerequisite for entry into the kingdom of God. Okay, so do we. So up to this point, we're in agreement. Now, things go off the rails from there, obviously, but um, they believe that baptism is a good thing, that it's necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And they take John 3, 5 um, as an example of that, which we do also. So they teach then that performing baptism for the dead allows the saving ordinance to be offered on behalf of those who have died without accepting or knowing Jesus Christ or his teachings during their mortal lives. And it's taught that this is the method by which all who have lived upon the earth will have the opportunity to receive baptism and to thereby enter the kingdom uh, of God. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question, just because I'm not familiar with Mormons as as well as I am, you know, s some other uh, religions. D their mode of baptism is it immersion? I I. <clears throat> Uh, I'm kind of like you. I I don't know Mormons, you know, the, the full extent of their doctrine, probably as well as I need to. I think so. Um, but, but for that, I would have to, I'd have to, I'd have to check. I know they, no, I, I'll just leave it there. I, I'm not going to surmise. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is also, but like you, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Right. Um, but I was just kind of interested. So, you know, at the very least, they believe some form of water baptism is essential to salvation. Right. Now, okay. as far as why they baptize, I believe that is a little bit different than what we, than what we teach um, hmm. ordinarily. But, but yeah, some form of water baptism, they believe, is, is absolutely necessary to enter the kingdom of God. Now, okay. yeah. So... From there, they, they go and they cite uh, a couple of, of different passages. So they use, it's over in 1 Peter uh, chapter 3. And we are familiar, of course, with verse 21, that there is also a any type which now saves us baptism, not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer of good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
they back up earlier than that um, for this particular belief um, as proof that even once you're dead, there can be saving things that occur. So verse 18, it says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So they would use those verses to say that, okay, look here, Jesus is preaching to souls that have already died. Why would he preach to souls that have already died if there was no hope? for them to be saved or to change their minds or to do something uh, to make a different choice. Um, now, that, that verse is, is probably one best to be saved for another time, but this is their, this is their argument. This is how they're setting it up. So, so I'm not going to respond to that, that particular verse. Um, Good, because I've already assigned it to someone else. So. <laughs> okay, perfect, uh, perfect. perfect. For, for, for those listening, we will address that, that verse in the future. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tune in next time. So, um, but that would be a verse that they would use to say that in the afterlife, you still have a chance. And I, I guess they would say this all the way up until final judgment. Well, I don't know what their, what their full eschatology belief. Anyway, they would say that once you're dead, you have the ability to to be saved. Um, right. And so they teach that those in the afterlife who have been baptized by proxy are free to accept or reject the ordinance done on their behalf. So baptism on behalf of a deceased individual is not binding if that individual chooses to reject it in the afterlife. So this baptism on their behalf can be done for them as a way that okay, you can now be saved if you want to, but if, if you're a soul in the afterlife and you don't want to be saved that way, then they would say that they have the free will to reject that and, and suffer the consequences. So, so is this teaching um, a teaching that Joseph Smith uh, prophesied about or something like that, or is this something that came after Joseph Smith? Just to kind from of get what, a timeline here. Yeah, from what I looked at, let me see where it is in my notes. Uh, I think it did come from Joseph Smith. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Ah, yes. Uh, there's a fellow by the name of Kevin L. Barney. Um, and he has this to say. He says, this thorough treatment of the mention of baptism for the dead in 1 Corinthians 15, 29 gives a meticulous analysis of Paul's Greek argument and lays out the dozens or perhaps hundreds of theories that have been put forth with respect to its interpretation. He concludes that the most natural reading and the majority contemporary scholarly reading is that of vicarious baptism. And he says, therefore, the prophet Joseph Smith's reading of the passage to refer to such a practice was indeed correct. So, yeah, it did come from Joseph Smith. This has been around for, uh, you know, for quite a while in, in that perspective. That okay. um, uh, that a proxy baptism. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Ah, uh, yeah. Any member of the LDS church, male or female, beginning in the year they turn 12 years old and holds a current temple recommend may act as a proxy in this ordinance. Men must also hold the Aaronic priesthood prior to entering the temple. Men act as proxy for deceased men and women as proxy for deceased women. So uh, apparently there was a controversy whether or not, um, you know, if you were a man, you could be baptized on behalf of a woman and vice versa. And they've they've narrowed it down now to where only men for men and women for women, for, for whatever that's worth. Hmm. Um, I wonder if a man can identify as a woman to for proxy baptism. <laughs> <laughs> Loophole. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I don't want to get political on that. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I don't know how they would. 
how they would come at that. But um, uh, I, I don't know how woke the Mormons are. I, I don't either. <laughs> I, I should ask one, I guess. Um, so, yeah, Smith first taught, Joseph Smith first taught the doctrine at the funeral sermon of a deceased member of the church, Seymour Brunson, in a letter written on October 19th, 1840. Um, so... So there you have it. That's that's the origin in the um, um, in the LDS Church. So, uh, you know, this has been something that quish, or Christians Christians have um, kind of contemplated, whether they know it or not. Um, we always wonder about the. Uh, destination we might say of those who have passed before us i mean <laughs> even first thessalonians and first thessalonians five or four four and five uh th this was something that the um the members of the church of thessalonica were worried about they were worried mm -hmm. about you know those who had passed before them and their resurrection and things of that sort and you know s still today you know if we study with someone they say you what about my grandma or uh, whatever it may be, whatever relative it may be. So this is something that we've always been curious about and in some form or fashion is, you know, life after death and what that's like. And um, I, I think whenever we look at, uh, we look at the uh, Lazarus, um, not, not the one Jesus raised from the dead, but the, the poor man Lazarus, is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. Something in Lazarus. We see a glimpse into, we might call it the Hadean realm, Abraham's mm -hmm. bosom. And um, the one who was sinful didn't seem to be offered any opportunity to redeem himself or, or to even uh, warn his family of impending doom or anything like that. We don't see things like that happening um, in the Bible. And mm -hmm. so it, it raises the question why this doctrine would come about, um, why people would believe that they could somehow affect the eternal destiny of those who have already passed when we don't see evidence of that in the Bible um, in any way. Right. Uh, it's like you say, it, the, it tugs. The, the it rich tugs man and Lazarus. Sorry. I said Lazarus and the poor man. The rich man and Lazarus. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think had to redeem myself. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had time. You know, it was it was before death, so so you could do that. <laughs> you know, it's that topic is one, and and even for you know the most ardent believer, it's one that tugs at the heartstrings, right? Because um, mm -hmm. we all have people, whether it's in our you know immediate lives or beyond that that aren't where where we want them to be and uh, spiritually speaking that they uh, that they aren't following the lord um that they haven't been baptized that they you know uh, aren't living the life that they need to be living so it causes us to to think and perhaps dig in places instead of accepting the finality that death that death is and from that example there of the rich man and lazarus i think is that Luke 15? I know it's in Luke. Uh, I don't know. I, I called it the, the poor man in Lazarus. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not the person to ask here. Well, <laughs> I, I don't know how inflation and all that works into, uh, <laughs> into this conversation, but maybe by today's standards, he was poor. I, you know, who's to say, Yeah. but <laughs> um, we look at that and I think, that particular example is a, is a very powerful one. I'm glad you brought it up, actually, because um, the longer you sit and think about what this proxy baptism position is is trying to posit here by looking at those uh, those verses over there in First Peter chapter three, um, you can look at things and you can start to take them. I believe in in a way that they were never meant to be. Uh, a way they were never meant to be used. 
and you can start to think, okay, maybe there's a little hope. And, and as human beings, all it takes for us is just to latch on to a little bit of hope, right? For us to, um, to start believing things that, that may not make all that much sense, biblically speaking. So it's, it's sad, I think, in a way. And it's, this doctrine, I think, is, is born from, from genuine sadness, particularly from, you know, when did Joseph Smith teach this? He taught it at a funeral, uh, at the funeral of a deceased member of, of the church. Um, I was trying to see if I had a snippet of the actual letter here. I'm, I'm not sure, sure that I do, but um, that to me seems to be seems to be the origin of things. And, and it's very sad. And I hate, I hate that that's the case. And we all wish for that different reality. Right. But, um, there's, there's just certain things that we have to accept. If there's one thing that we desire as a human race, it's always more time, mm. um, more time to make up for, past mistakes, more time to spend with our loved ones. Um, we want, we make movies about putting on a bunch of rings and be able to time travel and all that. But yeah, uh, you know, we, we don't like hopelessness. That's mm -hmm. not something that's not a comfortable feeling for us. And whenever a loved one passes and we have at least a inkling of doubt, whether they're, going to a uh in, in, to heaven or that's their final destination um you know if we have an inkling of doubt whether they're going to make it then it's a hopeless feeling that we would like to be able to do something for we would like to be able to affect it in some way we'd like to time travel and you know spend more time with them and preach the gospel to them or maybe I, a lot a lot of things may enter someone's mind and, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that this was pre first presented at a funeral, I think, speaks to that, um, you know, th that hopelessness that and, you know, us wishing that we had more time. I, I see here in the in your notes, just speaking of kind of hopeless situations and, and in this case, a very unfortunate situation um, that this doctrine even entered the Jewish Holocaust. Mm -hmm. uh, how did it do that? So interestingly, they've, uh, Mormons have performed temple ordinances on behalf of a number of individuals. So, you know, I, I guess if, if you're really, uh, you know, gung ho on this particular position, you'll be happy to know that the founding fathers of the United States uh, all the U.S. presidents, Pope John Paul II, John Wesley, Christopher Columbus, uh, Joan of Arc, uh, and Buddha, they've all, they've all been baptized for. Maybe less happy is the fact that Adolf Hitler and Genghis Khan and Joseph Stalin have also uh, been baptized for as well. So, you know, there's... Uh, and this is where this controversy really, really comes from. Uh, and a very sad one at that, uh, or it sprung into a controversy about the Holocaust. So they've performed, the LDS Church has performed these proxy baptisms, uh, and they do it for every, they say, every race, sex, creed, religion, uh, or morality on earth. They do it for everybody. And again, if you believe that there is some hope that even once you're dead, again, uh, as you pointed out, Stuart, contrary to, you know, what we see there with the rich man and Lazarus, if you really believe that, then, you know, you're just going to perform as many as you can uh, and just give everybody the, that opportunity. If that's if that's what you believe is a is an honest way to uh, to convert some people. And I guess, you know, if you want to talk about conversion numbers, uh, think about writing up a field report for. I converted, I baptized, I don't know how many people converted all these, all these dead people. Mm. That's a, it's a whole lot easier to convert dead people than it is living ones. I would think in <laughs> when you're using proxy baptism. Um, Luke 16. Luke 16. Uh, okay. Just for the, 
just for those listening is the rich man and Lazarus. If you care to look into that yourself. There you go. Luke 16. And that's worth, it's always worth reading. Uh, but that particular passage is, is important in this, in this conversation. So, um, the LDS church has baptized both victims and perpetrators of the Holocaust. So that, hmm. that creates some problems. So they've, they've baptized for Anne Frank, uh, they've baptized for Adolf Hitler. And that's contrary now to modern church policy. Uh, they've, they've changed that. And I believe after the controversy that arose from that, um, some of the Holocaust survivors and Jewish organizations, they really objected to this practice. So some of the things uh, that, that they would say uh, would be uh, things like things like this. Uh, they tell me that my parents' Jewishness has not been altered, but a hundred years from now, how will they be able to guarantee that my mother and father of blessed memory who lived as Jews and were slaughtered by Hitler for no other reason than they were Jews will someday not be identified as Mormon victims of the Holocaust? So mm. again, it, it, it comes just from a general misunderstanding of what the afterlife is like um, on, on both on both sides. And, and I would think, you know, it, trying to, you know, put yourself in somebody else's shoes. If I were a Jew, certainly for me as a Christian, I don't want someone else meddling in or trying to alter or change however they would put it in in my salvation or my eternal destiny. Now, I know that they can't, but if you were of the opinion, um, as as these particular Jews were, that maybe you could, or maybe that their memory would be altered or there would be uh, some kind of repercussion, then yeah, that would be that would be really troubling, I would think, and something that I wouldn't uh, necessarily want them want them to do. So I don't know if you have the answer to this question, um, but I'm going to ask it anyways. W what goes into their process of picking who they baptize for? Um, because as you said, they'll baptize for the Holocaust victims and they'll also baptize for uh, Adolf Hitler. Do they just baptize for everyone because God, you know, wants all to be saved and so that they don't have any discretion not that i i want these people to be lost that's not what i'm saying Obviously. I, I, i'm just asking you know what's their process if you know of picking who they baptize for i think i had something about that um so since the early 90s and i think that's when part of this came about the lds church has urged their members to submit the names of only their ancestors for ordinances, that is for the proxy mm -hmm. baptism, and to request permission of surviving family members of people who have died within the past 95 years. So there have been hundreds of thousands of improperly submitted names not adhering to this policy, um, and they've been removed from the records of the church. So wow. um, I think I think prior to this, it was just, it was a free for all, it was everybody, but, mm -hmm. When when controversy comes, uh, things things get cracked down. So I think now it's it's a lot more specific. And uh, this may be uh, old data. Uh, this may have changed, you know, even even since that time. But um, it, it seems to me that their their selection process is purely that of um, family members and people that you can trace your genealogy to, and with the permission then of surviving family members if they can if they can go ahead and do this so we, we've talked a lot about the the history here yeah um let's get into the verse a little bit um what are some of the positions that we see uh, other than the mormon position what are some of the positions that we've seen or interpretations we see with uh, verse 29? Okay, so when once you take out the proxy baptism position, um, mm -hmm. I think there are three remaining plaus semi-plausible views. So 
Um, the first is the argumentum ad hominem, which is uh, what uh, Burton Kaufman um, uh, proposes in his commentary. And that is uh, the, that simply means the argument to the person and refers to several types of arguments, some but not all of which are uh, fallacious. So he supposes that there was actually a baptism, historically speaking, on behalf of the dead in the day of Paul or prior to hmm. when this, this letter was written that was being practiced in that time that he's referring to, that Paul is not condoning this, but he uses it to show that even other groups, uh, bab that other groups baptize in the hope of the resurrection. So he says this, he says, Paul here used an argumentum ad hominem, that is an argument based upon what people were doing, indicating clearly enough that some persons known to the Corinthians were practicing a baptism for the benefit of the dead. But the one thing that makes it impossible to suppose that Paul approved of such a thing is the use of the third person pronouns. So, and this is the point that, uh, that we were talking about earlier, the use of they in that passage. Mm -hmm. So Kaufman would say that that would be, that is proof that this is not talking um, to Christians or about Christians, that this is solely talking to other people that are doing this just somewhere out there. Um, and they are doing it because they believe in the power of a resurrection. So if they believe in a power of a resurrection, why don't we as Christians believe in the power? Because our savior actually rose from the dead. Now, hmm. In order to substantiate such a view, you have to have evidence that there was a baptism for the dead prior, prior to the second century, prior to Tertullian, prior to Serenthus uh, and Marcion. And that's really hard to prove. The best proof that's out there, and this is actually what the Mormons uh, would say as well, uh, as to why um, this baptism, um, why it's both proxy baptism and that there was a, a pattern for doing things on behalf of the dead. They point back to a particular passage in 2 Maccabees. So in 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verses 43 through 46, and um, again, this is, you know, this is a, um, intertestamental literature. This is uh, apocryphal literature. This is not, these are not inspired books. Um, and um, actually, Brother Matthew Schaefer recently at the Midmost Study, he, he gave a presentation on, on intertestamental literature that's really good, um, should be coming out shortly. So, a little. Yeah, how about you go that. ahead? Yeah, how about you go ahead and plug uh, Christian Landmark? <laughs> Yeah, christianlandmark.com. Uh, you can find it on Facebook, YouTube, um, look it up online. And um, our uh, Mid-Missouri study here, it's um, 10 presentations, 10 Q&As, and uh, those will be coming out here here this month, uh, here probably in the next week or two is when we'll start releasing those. So uh, be on the lookout for those. Uh, Matthew Schaefer's is is relevant to our um, discussion today, but there's uh, I thought everybody did a really good job. It, we had a really great year this year. Oh, it was it was probably one of the best I've been to. And um, you're right, Matthew Schaefer did do an excellent job on mm -hmm. on his topic, and I would definitely recommend subscribing to Christian Landmark. Yeah, see, there you go. Uh, there subscribe, you go. subscribe to Christian Landmark, and and then hit the bell, and you'll be notified when that video comes up. How'd I do? Did I do all right? Oh, that's that's good. Oh, we'll cut you a check later. How, how's that? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so they use this passage, and now Kaufman doesn't. But in order to support Kaufman's position, you would have to use this passage also. So it's 2 Maccabees chapter 12, verse 43 through 46. It says there, And when he had made a gathering throughout the company to the sum of 2,000 drachmas of silver, he sent it to Jerusalem to offer a sin offering, doing therein very well and honestly, in that he was mindful of the resurrection. 
For if he had not hoped that they were slain, should have risen again, it would have been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. And also, and that he perceived that there was a great favor laid up for those that died godly. It was uh, a holy and good thought, whereupon he made a reconciliation for the dead that they might be delivered from sin. So, um, both your LD, your LDS position and and I think even Kaufman's position would rely upon this particular verse saying, or these particular, you know, historical things. And the context, if I, if I remember right, is um, this is at the end of a battle. And the soldiers here, that's what this, uh, this offering and these prayers are offered on behalf of. Uh, that they are offered for the dead. Uh, in hopes that um, there's going to be a resurrection, and uh, and that they might be relieved of any sin that they may that they may have had. I, there's more to it than that, but that's that's the summation. To me, though, that is it's a pretty. If that's your proof, and that is their proof, that's like the the whole of their proof. That okay. Judaism practiced things on behalf of the dead. Therefore, in Christianity, we have proxy baptism or we have baptism for the dead. Uh, even if Kaufman's position would be, even if we don't do it now, they did back then. And he's using some example of what happened back then as, as an argument to say, okay, we can do it now. To me, that's, it's really weak. Um, and also, once you get into this particular time period, um, I, I would hardly say, because we know, uh, in fact, I have it up here. This was, um, of course, uh, Judas Maccabeus. So, and that's what um, Maccabees is, is based off of, and the Maccabean dynasty. And they would go in and, if I remember correctly, they would set up... Um, uh, a priesthood that was not according to um, the Aaronic order, um, people who were not of of Aaron's descendants. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but th they did a number of things. They were amazing tacticians, but they did a number of things that weren't um, right according to the law of Moses. Yeah. yeah. So to me, Kaufman's position it's interesting. Uh, it resolves it. It resolves this verse in a way that um, that makes it just kind of a throwaway phrase. Uh, mm -hmm. It, but it, I don't think historically speaking, you can you can really bank on this and say that this is exactly what what is being talked about here. One of the biggest issues I have with you know some of the interpretations of this verse. And I would say more so the the proxy position um, that the Mormons have. If this was a a doctrine that was to be part of the Christian's life, that we baptize people for other people who have already gone, that would be a major staple or pillar in the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would see verses left and right, you know, supporting this. And we would mm -hmm. see, you know, clear instructions on who, how this was to be done and who it would be for and things of that and explaining how it works. And mm -hmm. it almost seems like you're making an individual other than Christ, someone's Messiah. Mm. Yeah. You are, you are saving someone on behalf of someone else that's not Christ mm -hmm. and making them their Messiah. And I, I don't see how that works with an understanding of baptism, with an understanding of, you know, even if you don't believe in baptism, I'm sure some people listening on here don't believe baptism is necessary for salvation. Mm -hmm. But even if you don't believe that baptism is necessary for salvation, 
and understanding how redemption works through Christ, I don't see how we can fit this in with the 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 picture of of the gospel. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. In fact, you know, you were talking about if this were the case, this would be a staple, you know, something that's brought up more than just in passing in the context of even something else, as it is here in 1 Corinthians 15. If baptism by proxy and ultimately, like you're talking about, salvation by proxy, because it's not it's not them that are being baptized. It's someone being baptized on their behalf. And what other step of salvation does that work in? No one would say that I could believe on behalf of someone else, right? Sure. Uh, I certainly can't repent because the whole definition of repentance is that I have a change of mind that leads to a change in action. Uh, the dead can't repent. That's uh, of... <laughs> And I guess of any any more than they can partake of the Eucharist, you know, there's a lot of things that the dead can't do, but the dead certainly can't repent. So so why would we think that baptism uh, can just be done by proxy um, with none of the other qualifications being met? And even those who might be listening that don't believe in baptism for the remission of sins, we all agree that you have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That, that's a baseline. We believe in that. We believe that you have to repent of your past sins, that you can't keep living in sin anymore, that there has to be a change of life, that you have to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So why would, why would proxy baptism just be thrown in there um, when none of these other requirements could, could ever be met by those who have already passed? Not to mention... You know, you think about the book of Romans. Uh, let me just pull up this passage here. Uh, you know, Romans chapter 10, um, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. That's that's what Paul wanted. He wanted Israel to be saved. And then the Apostle Paul, the same one that wrote 1 Corinthians fifteen twenty nine, has a lengthy... Uh, discourse there in chapters 9 through 11 talking about how the nation of Israel has been rejected by God because they've rejected the gospel and that they can be brought back in, but they have to believe um, and obey the gospel in order to do that. So if proxy, uh, proxy baptism is something that's even a thing, then it's talked about nowhere and it negates so, so many other passages kind of takes away the urgency of spreading the gospel doesn't it oh, yeah. uh, especially to, especially to our our family members who are of similar sex or same sex we might say uh right. you know w why would i preach the gospel to my my grandpa i can just wait until he's dead and and be baptized on his behalf and you know let right. grandpa enjoy enjoy his life and live it however he wants and i'll i'll take care of him but w <laughs> which is w now that I think about it, th that's kind of a Hindu thing as well. Um, mm. Hindus expect their offspring to help in their their casting in the next life. Right. In other words, the 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 child of a Hindu, if they remain felt faithful, that helps them in their cast in the next life. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a similar teaching in that. The faithfulness of of someone else helps you essentially not in your caste but your eternal destiny um, right. and your salvation. It's dependent on someone else rather than you being responsible for your decisions that you've made. And right, uh, th th that that brings up another question. So l let's say my grandpa died. I. I believe that you can be baptized on his behalf. Mm -hmm. And so I get baptized on his behalf. Does that dead person, uh, and again, this is hypothetical because we don't believe this, but um, <laughs> could that dead person accept or reject that baptism? Um, in other words, if grandpa's just fine with the decision he's making, he doesn't want to be 
uh, if he doesn't want you to save him, um, can he reject your baptism and say, nah, I'm good? You know, I love hypothetical theology. It's just, <laughs> it's, so, it's so entertaining. You know, I think, I think that the LDS church would say that, yes, he, such an individual can either accept or reject um, that proxy baptism. Now, you know, from Luke 16 and the rich man being over there in torments, I think he would have taken just about any route that he that he could have out of there. I, I don't think he wanted to stay there. He wanted to make sure no one went to the same place he did. So why, why would anyone, once they got to that point and they say, okay, the afterlife is real now, glad, <laughs> glad somebody told me, wish I had done this sooner. And then I don't know who comes and tells them, you know, maybe there's some, some angel over there, or, you know, in this hypothetical theological <laughs> discussion, some yeah. angel, or maybe it's Abraham or whoever. Hey, guess what? You've got a, you've got a grandson uh, that was baptized on your behalf. Are you in? Nah, the, count me out. I, I like where <laughs> I'm at, actually. Uh, I think that's, uh, if I accept that, that's going to affect, <laughs> affect my status. And, uh, no, I, I'd rather just, like, I, I can't see, even in this hypothetical realm, I can't see how that, who's going to reject that? That's the whole point of um, of that passage there in Luke 16, is that when it's turned to sight, when he actually sees what the afterlife is all about, then he's like, then the realization comes. Then the regret sets in. Then the urgency to send back Lazarus so uh, my brothers don't have to suffer the same fate. That's when all of that kicks in. And even, and I think even in that, even if um, you were to take the, the second Maccabees passage, literally, that they did things on behalf of, um, behalf of the dead, that would have been uh, nigh on to 150 years before Jesus would have been teaching that particular um, uh, passage. So that, to me, that would indicate if that was something that they regularly, regularly did on behalf of the dead, they would still be doing that. And Jesus doesn't recognize that as, as a possibility, that once you're dead, you're dead. That's, uh, death is the end. It's the end of chances. Uh, for us to make our, our life right. Okay. Thank you for uh, amusing me. Um, <laughs> you bet. And, and uh, answering my hypothetical question to the best of your ability. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. So what are some more plausible um, interpretations of this verse? We've We've gone through... You know, what doesn't seem to fit? What does fit? Right. Yeah. So I hate that we have to go through so much as we did to get down to this point. I, I believe there are two positions that really hold any kind of merit. And I hate that we're not going to spend the same amount of time on them as we did on proxy baptism. But I think you do have to have to get over that hump because a lot of people would say, and even, even if you look at the Greek uh, on, on the passage, the most natural reading of it would be proxy baptism, the way that it breaks down. We know from biblical hermeneutics and harmonizing passages, it, it cannot be proxy baptism. So what else is it? To me, there are two potential views. And I go back and forth on these views. I'm not 100% sure which one I fully believe. Uh, I could very easily see myself explaining it one way and then someone to someone else and then someone coming up behind my shoulder and say, well, I thought it meant uh, the second thing. And I was like, mm, yeah, it could be that too. And, and these are the reasons why. So I'll just lay out these two positions and I'll let our, you and our audience, you know, come up with, what, what you think is, is the most logical. I think either of these two positions does not jeopardize uh, any biblical doctrine. In fact, both of these positions rather enforce 
biblical precedents that are found elsewhere. So the first that I would point out is um, the martyrdom position, that this is talking about martyrdom and it's talking about sufferings. So this view, it proposes then that the word baptism is being used in a figurative, metaphoric type of a fashion, rather than a literal act of baptism. Um, and in that position, you know, baptism, that word, baptizo, it's not always used in the Bible to talk about Christian water baptism. It's used in other areas, too. Um, for example, you have John the Baptist talking about how the one who was coming, Jesus the Christ, he wasn't uh, worthy to, uh, you know, loose the latchet off of his sandals, and he was going to be baptizing them in Holy Spirit and fire. Obviously, those are different baptisms. That's not our discussion today. But it goes to show that baptism, that word, can be used in different ways. Um, also, baptism, baptism of sufferings and baptism of persecution uh, are also referenced. So you have Mark chapter 10. Uh, in Mark 10, verse 38, uh, and this is, this is where James and John, or depending on the... Um, on which account you're reading, it's the mother of James and John, uh, that, that comes to Jesus and asks if um, in the kingdom, if James and John can sit on the right and the left hand of Jesus. And Jesus says to them, uh, you do not know what you ask. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism that I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those to whom it is prepared. So here, the baptism of Jesus is not the baptism that he encountered um, by John the Immerser. Um, most all agree that this is a baptism that he suffered with his death on the cross. Uh, where he is flooded, if you will, immersed, plunged into sufferings. Um, Luke 12, verse 50 is another example of this, where Jesus says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. Again, the same type of idea of a distress, of a suffering, of a persecution. So if we look at verse Corinthians fifteen twenty nine in this way, that baptism for the dead is a baptism of suffering or a baptism of persecution. Um, so it would, it would read like this. Otherwise, verse 29, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? And why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. So here, death... Um, and those that are dead, uh, obviously Paul wasn't, he wasn't keeling over every day. That would, um, <laughs> uh, uh, Luke would, Luke the physician would probably record that in the book of Acts if, if that's what was going on, if he was keeling over. But here he's using death in a manner uh, to talk about persecutions. Verse 32, if in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me? If the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So um, so in this reading, it's talking. he's talking about persecutions. Why do we suffer what we suffer if there is no resurrection? And this calls back to the context in verses 12 through 20. Uh, I forget it's either verse 18 or verse 19 where he talks about um, if in this life, well, I've got, got my Bible right here. Might as well just look at it. <laughs> um, verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If this is all that we have, then we are the most pitiable people that ever have been or ever will be because what do we have to look forward to. Why would we suffer everything that we do if, if there is no resurrection, if there is no hope 
uh, beyond the grave. So to me, this answers, it answers a lot of questions. Um, there are a couple of difficulties with this, which is why I don't accept it um, in, in the fullest extent. Namely, it's not the usual meaning of, of the word baptized. Um, with the other examples that we saw, uh, we saw baptism. There were other things that you could see that talked about uh, suffering, and you could see that baptism was being used in this way. Um, here, baptism is only referenced in verse 29, and it's kind of an outlier. Uh, although you can see from the context being talked about persecutions and sufferings and this sort, it's not the usual way that baptism is translated or that we understand it. So that that is a difficulty. It's not uncommon, um, but it is slightly rare. Um, and also, um, in a passage, and this is uh, a hermeneutical type of thing, when we're looking in this type of literature, um, we we shouldn't take, we shouldn't resort to the metaphorical meaning of a word unless it's absolutely necessary, it demands that by the context, right? So, yeah, go ahead. So, I, I just had a quick question, and this isn't yeah, yeah. really relating to something you just said. Um, but just as I look at the text, you know, usually if there is a therefore, we wonder what it's there for. Here right. we have an otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, otherwise is probably continuing a thought or giving a thought in opposition to something that had been said, or it's somehow con continuing a argument. Mm -hmm. Do you think that otherwise links up to what was said in verses like 27 and 28? Or do you think that th that otherwise may be bringing us back to what's said in 12 to 20? I could see it being both. More okay. so the otherwise... I think being the reference to the fact that there is a resurrection and that's what verse 20 is all about, but Christ did rise from the grave. So, and he's, he's affirming here that there is a resurrection of the dead. And then otherwise, um, why would bringing back to, if there is no resurrection, that, um, that makes a lot of sense. It, at least that's that's probably what I would say. What I would say at this point. So it, I think it it's a reference to the whole, uh, to verses twelve through twelve through twenty and well twelve through twenty eight, um, mm -hmm. but probably more specifically the the twenty through twenty eight, the affirmation that um, resurrection is real and the consequences of that resurrection being real. What's going to happen? you know, when this life is over. Otherwise, if there is no resurrection, then going backwards. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for clearing that up for myself and probably those listening. Do you have anything else to say about what you called the martyrdom position, or do you want to move on to uh, more plausible, not more plausible, but another plausible interpretation? That's That's about all I had to say to say in that regard. I, I'm sure there's more to say, but that's all I had uh, at that point. Okay. So I remember at the beginning, you said there, there are two in your mind that you think are possible. So what is the second one that you think is uh, an impossible, not impossible, a possible <laughs> interpretation of this? So, um, so my second, and probably the one that I would lean more towards um, it's kind of anticlimactic at this point. Um, but I think it would be Christian baptism. It would just be water baptism for the remission of sins. That's what, um, this particular passage is, is looking or is referring to. Um, others would say that it would be baptism in hope of resurrection. So again, 
the whole first part of chapter 15, he's setting up, Paul is, an argument for the validity of the resurrection. He stated that there is, if there is no resurrection, Christ isn't raised, preaching's in vain, they're still in their sins, all who've died in Christ, they're perish. And without the resurrection, the whole of Christianity falls apart. So he picks up here in verse 29, he affirms that resurrection is real, verses 20 through 28, and then 29 is where the otherwise comes into play. So he talks about baptism, he talks about the sufferings that they face because of the gospel. And if the dead rise not, then what is the point to any of it? So notice that Paul has already inferred that those who have died in Christ are not going to perish. So the baptism for the dead in which the living are baptized on their behalf, um, that that is referring to the baptism for the dead that is being talked about here, uh, it's not going to affect their eternal state. Whatever this is, it's not going to affect their eternal state. So, when you look at passages like Romans chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, all should, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. So baptism in and of itself is, is all about death, burial, and resurrection right? It's built into the baptism model. Um, J.W. McGarvey says this in his commentary on 1 Corinthians. He says, the dead are a class of whom Christ is the head and first fruits under resurrection. By baptism, that is Christian baptism, we symbolically unite ourselves with that class and so with Christ. And we do this because of the hope that we shall be raised with that class through the power of Christ. So when we are baptized for the dead, as it says there, we do so in the fact that we are baptized with view of the resurrection. We're not baptized on their behalf because the dead don't need that. That's already been confirmed earlier in the chapter, that it's not going to affect their eternal state. But Paul, he's I think he's pointing to the very basic tenets of Christianity, which is salvific baptism, baptism for the remission of sins. Um, and you'll notice also that Paul does not say um, that it was the current Christians who were being baptized. He talks about how it's the they that are being baptized. And the reason I think this would be talking about new converts in, in this, in this mm -hmm. view, it's talking about the they that are being baptized would be new converts. They are baptized for the dead or in view of the resurrection um, they they are new converts and we would be established converts then right right okay in in this view and so so earlier when, when you were asking asking that that it's kind of a uh it's kind of a hard point just just to nail down from from the martyrdom position these would be christians right Mm -hmm. From this particular position, we're talking about people who are being baptized, the they, new converts, being baptized into Christ or being baptized for the dead, i.e. in hope of the resurrection. Um, so that would be my case for, um, for this second view. I think it's either talking about Christian baptism or it's talking about martyrdom. And I'm not I'm not terribly dogmatic on either of those. I think both have their points, and both perhaps have their flaws. Um, but I think both viewpoints could be made out of this particular passage, um, and still be within context, and still emphasize things throughout Scripture as well. I I think of those two. I would probably lean towards the second personally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at, at least looking right now, and maybe I'm overlooking something. Um, I don't see anything immediately in the context that are, that's talking about persecution of Christians. Uh, am I missing something in that? 
Well, that would be in verses what most would refer to there in verses 30 through 32. Okay. I think yeah, where the, he talks evil about company. Right. Uh, evil oh, company. That's and, 33. That's 33. Yeah. Um, fought with beast at Ephesus is, is the okay. main one there. Yep. And standing in jeopardy every hour there in verse 30. Okay. So yeah, I was looking so, prior to the verse. <laughs> yeah. Prior to the verse. Um, yeah. There's, there's nothing there about, um, about suffering Christians, particularly in that passage or in that section of verses uh, 12 through 20. Uh, that's just talking about, dare I say, regular Christianity. Of regular Christianity, of the things that we do regularly, um, if there is no resurrection, then we don't have forgiveness of sins. Um, the dead aren't raised. We don't have hope. All are bad things, obviously. But it's only then in verse 30 that um, mar the subject of martyrdom would be talked about at all. Yeah, and at least by the flow of thought, you know, from the martyrdom position, I could see 31 and 32 if it came prior to verse 29. Mm -hmm. Um since 31 and 32 are the introduction to persecution, I would say, or at least explicitly right? as an introduction to persecution, you would think that it would come before. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I can see some validity to both, but I think the second interpretation of Christian baptism seems to make the most sense to me, especially in light of like Romans six and things like that. Um, yeah. Seems to make the most sense. Do you see anything in the Christian b baptism position that gives you pause to think that it might be martyrdom or um, is there anything that prevents you from going a hundred percent into the Christian baptism position. Um, so the Christian baptism position is the one that I lean towards the most. The only thing, um, to me, what gives the martyrdom position, the most validity would be the verses following verses 30 through 32. in that context, like you say, I think What's keeping me from going full, the full martyrdom position is the fact that those come later. And whenever baptism is used in a way um, un, untraditional, if you will, um, in a way that's not referring to a water baptism, the context surrounding, well, the context prior to it is almost always setting up that this is that this is what's being talked about, right? Uh, particularly, I'd say in the Mark passage, um, before he talks about baptism, he he says, are you able to drink the cup that, that I am going to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? So there is a, there's a precedent already set with the cup analogy of drinking the cup. And we know that he, of course, uses that phrase in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, to refer to sufferings and things of this nature. There's a precedent set that this is what's going on, and then baptism is used. Um, I'd have to look a little bit more in, in the Luke passage. Um, in the Matthew passage with John the Baptist, the context there is of judgment. So judgment is already being talked about um, if I if I remember right, I don't know. That's well, that's worthy of more more discussion some other point in time. But I think if there had been more, or if verses thirty through thirty two came before verse twenty nine, or you know verse twenty nine came after, I think I would be more likely to see how um, martyrdom may be in view. But because it starts off with baptism for the dead, it seems it's hard for me to accept that um, 
it's a difficult reading of that particular passage. I see the logic why someone might might come to that position, and and I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, obviously you know uh, persecution is a bad thing, and if there is no resurrection, um, then why would why would we suffer persecution? That's obviously a correct position, but I don't. It's hard for me to say that that's what verse 29 is is referring to. So I lean towards Christian baptism position because if you hold that, that includes martyrdom with it. Um, because if you're baptized with hope of the resurrection, I mean, that's what they were, it's not the only thing, but that was a thing that they were being persecuted because of, because they were Christians. So to me, there's a lot more things that fit in with with the Christian baptism uh, position as opposed to uh, the martyrdom position. I don't discount it totally because of verses 30 through 32, but it seems less likely to me. Also, if we consider who is writing Paul, mm -hmm. um, the examples you gave of baptism being persecution or suffering Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but those were both Jesus, correct? That's right, yeah. And so do we see in any of other Paul's writings him use that word baptism to refer to suffering or persecution? That's a great point. I I didn't in in the study that, that I did. And, you know, I think... I think most of us know where where the word baptism pops up because of how much we we talk and study about baptism. But I I can't think of a place that it's used that way in any of any of the other Pauline epistles. Um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but but I think that's that's a pretty solid point too. Yeah, I, I off the top of my head can't think of any time that Paul used the word baptism mm -hmm. other than water baptism mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't remember any time when Paul talked about baptism of the Holy Spirit um, or baptism right. in fire well um, he does uh, 1 Corinthians 12 he would talk about let's see that may be that may be important Okay, so 1 Corinthians 12, yeah, verse, th uh, verse 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. No, nope. uh, never mind. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, baptism, Paul uses that pretty consistently, that word. Yes, so if we can look at Paul's writings... And and someone listening, if, if you can think of a time that Paul used the word baptism, that mm -hmm. it, it he was not talking about water baptism, please uh, shoot me an email at realbiblicalapplication at gmail.com. But as, off the top of my head, this is not scripted. We're, we're kind of just going back and forth here yeah, um, and working our way th through this logic. But if... If we can consistently prove that Paul, when he uses this word baptism, is always talking about water baptism, and he uses it several times, mm -hmm. then I think we can prove, you know, that here he's probably using it the same way, mm -hmm. um, or or at least give us a a good indication based on history that he's using it in this way. Um, but since we don't see Paul using it in the sense of suffering or, um, martyrdom or anything like that, I would say that it probably is not the way he's using it here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and, and I think that's, that's really fair to say, um, again, I, I, I'm just like one step short of just completely disowning it because, you know, you can look at other, I, I was recently studying, you know, over in Hebrews, um, and in chapter nine, 
Uh, there's an argument to be made with how the book of Hebrews translates the word covenant, right? Uh, I believe it's the Greek word diatheke. And consistently translated covenant, 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 all the way until chapter 9 and verse 16, I think. And then it's translated testament, um, as in last will and testament. I think there's even some passages that translate it will. In, in that particular passage. So there's an argument to be made, and there were arguments back and forth, whether that should be covenant or whether it should be testament. So it's not uncommon, even though a writer may use a word consistently, if we're using that as an example, um, he can use it really consistently through a writing and then come to a point and use it a different way. Um, and I'm a proponent that it should be translated testament or last will and testament there in chapter nine because of the context surrounding it. And in that case, it was actually the context of the last two verses um, after it and, and how he, he breaks down um, testament as being involved with um, death and inheritance. And both are things that uh, a covenant between two parties don't really deal with, but they do with the last will and testament. So um, I don't know if I'm playing devil's advocate here, but um, when when you're looking at the martyrdom position, there, even though it may not be used consistently, there still could be a way that you could say that maybe he he stops it here he stops using it consistently here in the, his normal way just to bring about this one particular point. Um, just illustration purposes. Right, just for illustration purposes. Now, is that, su is that a super strong argument? No, it's not. Um, so, so I'd hesitate just to hang my hat on it, but, but that's, that would be the reason why I'm still open. Yeah, I haven't... I don't know that I'm still open, but I haven't completely shut the door on on the martyrdom position. And if anyone else has any other positions or mm -hmm. some some things to point out um, that would maybe cause me or him to lean towards one or the other, uh, communicate with us. So send me an email, and I'll I'll either answer it or I'll forward you to Austin, and he'll answer it and uh we'll open a dialogue about it because at the end of the day as i've said many times we are human both me and austin i can assure right. you and and we are prone to you know occasionally make mistakes or you know i can't i if i were to look at all the things that i have believed in the past that have changed i would i would have you know a lot of things um so you know, th this isn't like a a final stamp. It has to be this. We're, no. I think, both of us are very open to being corrected and being taught and uh, having conversation. So, right. if you have an interpretation that we can um, learn from or a a angle that we we're, we're not seeing, then uh, let us know, and uh, we'll have a conversation about it. Uh, unless it's you, baptism over the dead, and I, I think we're both off that. <laughs> No kitty pools in the graveyard. Sorry. I, I'm so interested in, in how that's done, though. So if you have information on that, then let me know just for uh, that's right. my own personal interest. But do you have any closing remarks um, that you would like to make before we, we end this podcast? No, no. I, I think I'm good. I think I've said all I need to say. Um, just appreciate appreciate the opportunity coming on talking about this. It's been fun. Yeah. And uh, again, ch check out Christian Landmark uh, on YouTube or um, is ChristianLandmark.com, correct? That's right. Uh, as well, if you want to go to the website and there's lots of articles, there's videos and all sorts of materials that you can learn from uh, on that site. But um, we appreciate Austin coming on and the study that he's put into this topic. It's obvious that he's done a lot of study into this topic and that's one of the things that I enjoy about hosting a podcast like this is, you know, some of these things are things that I've intended to study more deeply and mm -hmm. 
and will study deeply, but having a conversation like this kind of forces me to at least study it a little bit and and to not just remain ignorant on the matter. Um, so I hope hope it was educational not only for um, you, but uh, it certainly was for me. So anyways, Austin, th- thanks for coming on and uh, we'll have you on again sometime. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks again for taking time out of your day to listen to the Real Biblical Application podcast. If you have any questions about the discussion that was had today, please email me at realbiblicalapplication at gmail.com. And remember, keep on learning and finding ways to apply the Word of God to your life.